Welcome to New Life Living, brought to you by New Life Church in Rio Rancho, New Mexico. We hope this Bible study led by Pastor Alan Brooks encourages you in living the new life Jesus is offering. Good morning. Morning. Whoa, there we go. Okay, they're, they're awake. I think the 9 o'clock people were more awake than that. They were. I'm Pastor Alan Brooks. I'm honored to be the pastor of this church here in New Life, and I'm with a special guest today, James Clovis. Would you help me welcome him? Howdy. <clears throat> Did you hear that guy that started clapping, you know, before the song was over? I think it was the pastor, wasn't it? Yeah, it was me. <laughs> You'd think I would know. It was like, we, we already done the song at 9 o'clock, right? So here I don't even know. But that was me, if that was you. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about James. James, one of our uh, ministry leaders here at the church. Uh, James, how long have you been with New Life? A couple of years now. Okay. James and I go back quite a ways, 12, 15 13, years, yeah, maybe. Somewhere yeah. Here. And I was your boss for a short time at, at another church. Very short, thank God. Yeah, he, yeah, he, <laughs> yeah, he was privileged by that. <laughs> no, it was good. was also his instructor uh, through a couple of different uh, program schools that they had there, the Shepherding School for Pastoral Ministry, and uh, just honored to be with you here to James. Thank today, you. James. You're it's a great it's brother. an honor for me to be here as well. Thank you for that, Alan. It is his first time, and uh, I would also share with you that uh, James is actually entering into a candidacy with our church as an elder. <laughs> and so if you're a ministry partner with us, we would encourage you to speak into his life, ask him questions. In fact, if you haven't heard this guy's testimony, that alone would change your life just to hear how God's worked, because it's pretty amazing stuff. God is definitely good. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, he brings some of us from the depths of the earth. Amen. Amen. But uh, anyway, so he'll be in that candidacy for the next few months. We're just observing what he does as he takes on some of the responsibilities without officially having, you know, the title to the role. So. Does that mean you're going to be my boss again? Of sorts, yeah. Yeah, so we'll... <laughs> Maybe just for a short time, though. <laughs> I wanted to encourage you with this. We have started already preparing before today, but if you haven't started with <laughs> us preparing, we are in Passion Week. As you've already heard, today is Palm Sunday, and we want you to really start being mindful about what we're going to be celebrating here a week from today. A week from today is Resurrection Sunday, and that tells us that He, Jesus, is risen, risen right? Our God is not dead. He's Amen. very much alive, okay? Risen. We're going to celebrate that. But there's some stuff that our God had to go through in order for that to take place. And that's what Passion Week really is all about. So we have Palm Sunday today, and we have prayed and hoped that God would really move in your hearts today through this message. But on Wednesday as well, in fact, we still have a handful of spots uh, for our Messianic Seder dinner here at the church on Wednesday night. And if you've never participated in that, that itself is absolutely mind-blowing to see how God has been re revealing his plan of redemption for quite a long time. Yeah, so we enjoy it. Good stuff. And then Friday is our Good Friday service where we really mourn at the foot of the cross, literally, and recognize, wow, this is what our Savior was willing to do so that our sins could be paid for. And that brings a lot more celebration, I think, to Sunday. A friend of mine this week, James, shared an article with me, and it was con contrasting how the world, as well as Christians, celebrate Christmas versus how they celebrate Easter. Oh, yeah. That there's so much more preparation that most of us do for Christmas. We put up lights, we decorate our house, we buy gifts, all those sorts of things in celebration of the birth of Jesus. But don't miss this, and this is what the article pointed out. If it weren't for Easter, Christmas really wouldn't make any sense. Just another birth. Yeah, it'd be just another person that got born, maybe a great teacher, uh, might celebrate his birth like Martin Luther King or yeah. somebody else. He might right? get a street named after him. Yeah, might get a street. Imagine that, Jesus Street, right? <laughs> but hopefully that's not you. Hopefully this week, maybe for the first time, you're really going to prepare to celebrate this holiday. It's the most important holiday on the entire Christian calendar, Resurrection Sunday. Amen. And all of this stuff leading up to that is for that. I'm going to add something else to it this week. I think this might be the most important Passover week that we've ever had in our entire lifetimes. Now, by the end of the message, you'll have a greater clarity of what I mean by that. But what if, what if this was one of those monumental Passover weeks? There was a monumental week 
couple thousand years ago that we're going to be looking at here in a moment yeah. when Jesus went to the cross. But what if we're in preparation for something that's so mind-blowing that you're going to miss it like so many did in the first century sure. if you don't get your mind right about what's going on? Amen? Amen. Last week, we entered into this by looking at a teaching where Jesus was up at Caesarea Philippi. Now, I want to show you on a map about where that is. It's very north in Israel. And he's up there with just his disciples. And he asks this very profound question. Does anybody remember the question that he asked his disciples? Help me. Who do you say that I am? Now, one spoke up. Peter spoke up. And he said he was the Christ. Now, James, you've heard this, I'm sure, too, but a lot of people think that that's Jesus' last name, right? Yeah. Like, you're Clovis, yeah, I'm another. Brooks, it's Christ, right? Yeah. That's not what it means. No, it means uh, anointed one. Yeah, Messiah, Messiah, the deliverer. It's actually the Greek word, Christos, mm. that is for the Hebrew word, Mashiach. Those of you that were with us in our Daniel study know that we talked a lot about the Mashiach. But what we're going to see today is something advancing even further, there was a little piece of trivia that I'll just share with you on the front end. We'll talk more about this on the back. But from the time of Adam to Abraham was 41 jubilee cycles. Okay. Do you remember how long a jubilee is? It's actually 50 years. Okay? It's a very special setup. But there were 41 jubilee cycles between Adam and Abraham. And to the, to the coming of Christ... There was another 41 from Abraham. Pretty amazing, isn't it? 41 cycles from Adam to Abraham. 41 additional cycles from Abraham to Jesus. This is how our God works. It's almost like clockwork, how he ties all of these elements and pieces together. And you're going to see even more of that hopefully by the end. I like that picture. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty exciting. Yeah. Now, Jesus also said to his disciples, beyond that eternal question, who do you say that I am? He told them that he had to go to Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem, to go back to our map, is about 200 miles south of where they were at Caesarea Philippi. Now, they didn't have cars in those days. Hopefully, you know that, right? So that's quite the long walk. Several days, maybe even a few weeks that it took for them to get down from Caesarea to the first place that we're going to look at today, Jericho. But when he told his disciples that he had to go to Jerusalem, it just wasn't for the Passover. You know, he annually went, as every Jewish male did, they would go all the way down to Jerusalem, you know, to be a part of the Passover. And to me, that's a great commitment. Would you agree? I, I do think it's a great commitment. There's a lot of, a lot involved in that. Yeah, together. make sure you got food and money so to spend on the road, yeah, getting your family down there. All the stuff <laughs> that goes to being a part of this. Yes. One of the three festivals a year that Jews went to Jerusalem for. And I was, I was talking with somebody in the lobby right before service, and they had told me that they drove here today from Portales. Oh, nice. That was even further, right? Of course, they probably had the advantage of a car, oh. right? <laughs> I don't think they walked this morning from Portales. But I often wonder how much more commitment people had at this time to the things of God than they do in our world today. I mean, yeah. very few people would think about driving from Portales to go to church service sure. on a Sunday morning, right? It's true. I mean, we paid them, so that's part of it. Oh, you paid them. <laughs> but what do you know about Jericho? Tell us a little bit about this place where they go to. Well, there's a few things that come to mind when I think about Jericho. One of them is the walls. We know that Israel conquered Jericho early on in their uh, they were coming into the, the promised, promised land, land with Joshua. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> um, excuse me. So we know, I, I think about the walls. I think about the conquest of Israel. I think about, uh, the second thing I think about is Rahab. She was the great, great, great grandmother of King David. I think about her being spared by faith because she hid the spies when they came to Jericho. Check out the land, yeah. They were checking, spying out the land. And I think she has a real great profession of faith in that portion of Scripture in Joshua as Might well. Might remind everybody what was Rahab's occupation. I believe she was a harlot. Yeah, by, she's a prostitute. Another yeah. person with a pretty radical in the lineage of Jesus. Yeah. yeah, in the lineage of Jesus. I love our God. He's a God of second chances, isn't he? <laughs> Amen to yeah, that. Amen to that. And three and, and so, four and five. <laughs> yeah, some of us need more. Yes. So I think of Rahab. I think of. Uh, I also I'm reminded that uh, Jericho's actual. Call, actually called by the city of palms as well 
which would be Palm Hence Sunday. the idea of Palm, Palm Sunday. What a great sure. connection to that. Yeah. yeah. So definitely. For those of you that may not know this, there were two Jerichos in Jesus' day. There was the older one where the walls fell down. Um, I always feel like I have to break out in song when I, when I hear the, that the statement. The walls right? come tumbling down. That was one of those overplayed songs from the 80s, for those of you that might not remember. Definitely. But <laughs> definitely overplayed, right? Yeah. But there was a second one, and King Herod actually built his winter palace there because this was like a resort place, this city of palms, and it was actually a very wealthy city. Definitely. And uh, the man we're going to see today is sitting outside of that newer city, we believe. And yes. So let's jump into our passage. We're in Mark 10, verse 46, reading out of the English Standard Version this morning. <clears throat> and they came to Jericho. This is Jesus and his entourage. And as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. And he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Amen. Amen. I love that statement, Son of David, have mercy on me. And <clears throat> I'm reminded of, as I think about this and I think about where he heard that, I mean, this would be a, a term that's common for Jewish Israel. people. The yeah, Jewish people would know what that term actually meant and what it, what it entailed what it brought with it, the connotations of it. And uh, especially when you have scriptures like in 2 Samuel 7, where the word says uh, God is talking to David about establishing his kingdom forever. He says, when, you are, when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now in the near, we know that he's talking about Solomon, who's fixing to become king. Uh, but in the far, he's talking about Christ. Jesus, and, yeah. and even further, that eternal kingdom that is still yet to be set up, mm -hmm. that's being built right now. And, and so when I think about that, and when I, 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 it makes me think, as I read this passage, what's the mindset of the crowd as they hear, Son of David, have mercy on me. I mean, they're, we've they're got expectant. All the, they're I, expectant. I would say they're really, I, I think they are definitely yeah. expectant uh, because they're, I mean, we're told it's a great multitude following him. And I, I have to wonder what their mindset is. I mean, some of them we know from other portions of scripture, they're definitely temporally minded. They're, they're wanting the immediate. They're looking for a king right now that's going to deliver them from the, the Romans. Roman rule. Yeah, kick the, rule, the Romans yeah, out. Yeah. For sure. I mean, uh, some of them, I think, may be following because of the bread. They're looking for temporal needs to be met. Christ fed the 5,000 multiple times. Four, I think it was four, four or 5,000. Five, yeah. uh, some, so some of, again, we got this temporary mindset, this temporal, this here, the now, the immediate that I see here. I mean, it's almost like the attitude is what's in it for me, especially when I see how they handle Bartimaeus after he cries out to David the first time, I mean, to Christ the first time, and they tell him, hey, be quiet. We're, we're on a mission here. They, it's like they don't want Jesus to be distracted by him mm -hmm. who has a need because they want their, their needs met first. Yeah, I imagine they weren't bothered by the son of David thing because that's no. pretty much what they're all thinking anyway. Hey, this is the promised king. Definitely. You know, he's the son of David. But it was him wanting something yeah. from Jesus. It's almost like, Shh, get up, quiet. Right. You know. Don't bother him right now. Yeah, Definitely. And so really, in, in essence, I feel like the crowd was totally blind to this man's needs. And, and so it, it brings up a, a takeaway for me that uh, I have to watch my own self. It's don't be so consumed with your wants that you're blind to the needs of others. Sometimes I can be so focused on what I think my ministry is or what I'm supposed to be what doing, I need. what I need. I'm, I'm so tunnel visioned that God is bringing these opportunities into my life to share, minister, and to uh, proclaim His goodness, and I'm so distracted by me that I forget them, right. or I walk right by them. And, yeah, and, the crowd's so focused on what they want to see happen yeah. that they can't be distracted by this guy. Yeah, definitely. You have to think after all this time on the, uh, the ministry trail that they're thinking that the temporal kingdom is fixing to be set up. Yeah, absolutely. They're really thinking that they're, he's fixing to overthrow Rome, probably. 
You would think. Yeah, definitely. So that brings me to Bart- Bartimaeus. I mean, we're not really told how long he's been in this condition. We're not told where he's from necessarily, but it would, I would assume he's from that area. He's parked outside of Jericho there. Uh, but what I love is that he's, whatever, wherever he's from or however long he's been there, I love the fact that he's acting on what he's heard. I mean, here he is. Uh, calling out Jesus, son of David. He's heard that. He's known that. The Jews, the Jewish nation, the nation of Israel has been expecting that. So Not only that, I'm, I'm willing to bet that he's heard about some other guys that have been healed, right? I, I that word is so. spread by everybody who's walked by. Probably some people that were yeah, blind. Definitely. That Jesus healed them. I mean, you have to think after a while, he becomes kind of like a fly on the wall. Mm-hmm. And that as he, people are passing, they're talking, and he's picking up all the tidbits of all the things that Christ has done. Right. And so that's probably even making him all the more uh, and expectant. Yeah, he's expectant. Definitely. Uh, you might, I, I, I take a picture of this as he is walking by faith, not by sight. Because he really is. Literally. Literally. <laughs> walking. He's acting on what he's heard and he's not worried. He hasn't seen Jesus. He hasn't. He just knows that he's the son of David and that that's who he needs. Yeah, I love the line out of the video where, you know, the person playing Bartimaeus said, you know, it, it amazed him that those that saw the best were, were the blindest. most blind. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think that's a danger area for all of us if mm-hmm. we're not careful. Definitely. Um, what I liked is uh, the takeaway for this section that I liked is really that he didn't allow what others say to keep him from calling out to Jesus. I think that's something that we have to remember because it's easy to uh, allow the public opinion, popular opinion. It's easy to allow what family members say. It's easy to allow what other folks are thinking or what other or the circumstances to dictate whether or not I call out to Christ. And we have to make sure that we we don't allow those things. Yeah, even the church today, I would say that society is trying to sideline us. You know, hey, keep keep your religion, your Jesus to yourself. And we don't want to don't want to hear about it. It's a true story. Yeah, It's, it's, it's a sad state, but the good thing is, is I have, a perf- I, I have a great example here of how not to let that happen. Right. Call out all the more. And I think this is true. You know, I, I heard something years ago that was attributed to Mother Teresa saying that, you know, it's a sad state of humanity that you don't reach out to Jesus until he's the last thing you, ha- he, yeah. you have left. And, and I think that's true of Bartimaeus is that here's a guy who for, again, how many years has been blind? He's desperate, right? That's, you know, he's ready for this life to change, you know, for him. And so he, he's not going to be dissuaded by the crowd telling him to be quiet. He cries out all the more. Definitely. That word literally means to wail. I mean, he, he wasn't, hey, Jesus. Hey, I mean, he's yelling. He's, he's shouting. He's giving it everything he's got. Yeah. And I think that's a good example for all of us. Absolutely. We need to give it everything we got when we call out to Christ. You know, I, I thought about this myself this week, and maybe you should too. When's the last time you cried out to God? Hmm. I mean, cried out to God. I'm not talking about prayed to God. I'm talking, cried out. You shouted out. Now, you might want to tell people around you when you start, if you're around people. Um, but I, I, I literally did this out in the wilderness where I live, and uh, you know, it was therapeutic, I would say. You know, that you cry out to God about something that's really on your heart. Nice. I like that. Let's go into the next section. Mark chapter 10, verse 49 through 52. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, take heart, get up, he is calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. Put yourself there for a moment. You're part of the crowd. You know Jesus is on a mission, right? He's got what in full view? The cross. He's got the cross, right? He knows that he has to go to Jerusalem to suffer and die. In the midst of that, you have this crowd that's driving forward with him through this. There's this guy crying out on the side. In the midst of that, Jesus stops. Wow, isn't that an amazing thing about our Lord? Amen. He's on a mission. He's tunnel vision, we sometimes call that. And yet, he can still see, he can still hear this person who needs him on the side. And again, what a conviction I think that is to the rest of us. Because what Jesus then does is he tells these very people that are telling Bartimaeus to be quiet, 
He tells those same people, tell him to come over to me. Do you realize that Jesus is still doing that today? Amen. Jesus wants to use us today to call people to himself. That really hasn't changed in 2,000 years. That's still part of what God has called us to. The mission, if you don't know, of this church is not just to know Jesus, but it's to go forth from here to make him known. The reason we gather on Sunday is so we know more about who Jesus is, but we're to leave from here out into the community where we go and make him known. Because he wants us to call people to himself. And here's Bartimaeus. Again, picture this. I loved how the video put it. I had not thought about it before the video is that, you know, here's a guy sitting on the roadside and there's this huge crowd of people coming by. He's trying to get a little bit closer and very likely to get trampled upon, right? Because he's, he's down low where people might not see him. But he's down there. He's got this cloak. Now, for us, I think a little bit of cultural understanding is helpful. A cloak in those days was this very long garment. Usually it was the most expensive piece of clothing that somebody owned, their cloak. They would use it for bedding sometimes. Beggars, what they would often do, especially blind beggars, is they would lay their cloak over their lap so that when people went by, they could drop the coins down into the cloak. And they would use it kind of like you know, a way to keep the money together. So here he is sitting on the side of the road. His cloak's got some coins in it. Jesus tells him, come to me. So he say, well, let, let me get my coins together here. And, you know, okay, got, got to hang my cloak up real quick. <laughs> Just a minute, Jesus. Okay, we're getting there, right? Is that what he does? No. No, he seems to spring to his feet, stands up, tosses his cloak aside. The coins, I'm guessing, probably just spread out to the side of the road. Is he concerned about, oh, where's my money going, right? Somebody get my money, right? We don't get that sense at all here, do we? No, not at all. I think there's a great truth in this, is that sometimes you need to cast stuff aside to receive what you truly need. Amen. Some of us here today are like Bartimaeus. You may not be physically blind, but you're spiritually blind to some things. You're hanging on to something or some things or someone. And that's become the center of your attention. And God's trying to tell you, He's been trying to tell you, it shouldn't be this way. Cast it aside. If you will cast that aside, I will give you what you truly need. Now, do you believe that truth? That God will give you what you truly need? Amen. Because it starts there. And that's where Bartimaeus is. He believes. He believes that Jesus has the answers to the problems of his life. That's part of some of our trouble. We don't really believe that. Mm. We think man or ourselves sometimes have the answers to our troubles. Show of hands, how many of you have had the best answer to the problems in your own personal life before? <laughs> the answers I've come up with usually led to more trouble, right? Definitely. A good so point. he stands up, goes over to Jesus, and, and classic Jesus here, right? Remember, Jesus is fully God and fully man. Jesus asks him, what do you want me to do? Like Jesus doesn't know. He does know, right? Why is he asking the question, though? Think about it. He wants the man to do the same thing that he wants some of us to do. He wants us, the man, Bartimaeus, to acknowledge the need he has. Profession of faith. A profession, a confession of faith. Yeah. Asking what was really most on his heart. What I love about Bartimaeus is he had this go big or go home kind of mindset, right? I mean, he doesn't ask for a few coins. He doesn't say, hey, a, a new cloak would be nice, right? He says, I want to see. He addresses him, though, as rabbi. I need to touch on this because I think it's such a big deal. Most of us know the word rabbi means, help me, teacher. teacher. This word that's used here in Mark is actually a very unique word for rabbi. We miss it in the English translation. But it's actually literally rabboni. It's only used twice in all of Scripture. The other time is in John with Mary Magdalene at the tomb. It's not just a teacher of Jewish scriptures like the regular, more common rabbi is. 
this is an intimacy term, that there's close relationship hmm. as well as submission of the person who's addressing the other person there. That's the way Bartimaeus is approaching Jesus. Rabbi, Rabboni. He takes that son of David thing really serious then. Absolutely, he does. And he says, let me recover my sight. Now, if it was simply an ordinary teacher, could an ordinary teacher help him recover his sight? No. Jesus is more than a great teacher. Would you agree? Amen. There's a lot of people in our world today that says, yeah, Jesus, he was all well and good. He was a great teacher, maybe a prophet, right? But they end it there. They don't see that he was any more than that. Notice that Jesus responds and he says, your faith has made you well. Here again is another word that I think we would miss just looking at the English, and it's the word well. The original word is sozo. We normally translate that as saved. In fact, some of you know a little bit about theology. The doctrine of soteriology, the doctrine of salvation, comes from this Greek word sozo. So we normally translate this word as saved. But here we're seeing it used as well. I believe that's intentional. That Jesus is making kind of a double entendre of sorts. Something that has two very different meanings all combined together. Certainly he was trying to tell Bartimaeus that his faith had given his sight back, right? Definitely. But I also believe by what we see next that he's telling Bartimaeus that it's not only healed him physically, it's healed him spiritually. We see the word sozo again in Ephesians 2.8 where there it says, For by grace you have been sozo, saved through faith. That very famous passage, and this is not your own doing, it's a gift of God. Praise the Lord. See, Bartimaeus thought the only gift maybe that he was receiving that day was the gift of sight. That he got so much more of a gift than just sight. We often think that if God could heal this or fix that, it would be the ultimate. No, the ultimate is this gift of salvation. Amen. Which, of course, is what Bartimaeus has seen. The takeaway I would give you here on this is that with Jesus, you should be expecting a miracle. Amen. Let me say, amen. amen. Thank amen. you. Let me say it again. With Jesus, you should be expecting a miracle. Amen. With man, we can't necessarily expect that. But with Jesus, we can be and should be expecting a miracle. That's exactly where Bartimaeus was that day. He was very expectant. He believed that not only was Jesus a great teacher, that Jesus is a miracle worker. Amen. That's the God that we serve. That's the God that we celebrate this week. That's why it's such a big deal. Shame on us if we play down how significant this particular time of year is. That's exactly why I continue to pray for my kids. Because I believe in a miracle. I don't know when. I don't know how. Mm -hmm. I don't know how, what he has planned. But I know that he is able. And, that I, and I expect him to do. I mean he desires none would perish. Right. And even like Bartimaeus. Be persistent about be it. Be persistent about it. Don't yeah, give up. Definitely. Notice what Jesus does though. After he tells him that his faith has made him well. He tells Bartimaeus. To go his way. Now put that in perspective. Let's say it's you. You've been blind maybe since birth. Those people that you've been close to in your life, you've never even seen their face. You've maybe touched them with your hands, but you've never seen the people that are the closest to you. Family, friends, maybe children. Bartimaeus has never seen them. Jesus lets them off the hook and says, hey, go your way. Is that what Bartimaeus does? No. Bartimaeus chooses to join the crowd and follows Jesus. He puts aside, I think, what would have been a very personal want to see some of the people that he was close to in his life so that he could follow Jesus. But don't miss why. It's because he believes he's the son of David. Yep. He believes that this entourage with Jesus going into Jerusalem is the advent of the coming kingdom. Does he want to be eating falafel at his home when he could be there when Jesus ushers in his kingdom? I don't. 
No, right? He wants to be on the scene, see it with his own eyes. Let's go on in Mark 11. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord has need of it, and will send it back here immediately. And they went away and found a colt tied at a door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, What are you doing, untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said, and they let them go. Amen. When I think about Bethany and how familiar this area was to Jesus, I mean, it's the hometown of Mary and Martha. It's where he raised Lazarus. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's familiar to him. And then I think, and I even go back and I think about Rahab. He's basically walking where his ancestors walked. And, 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 And then I look at all the detail that Mark has given us in this just to, in go the fetch preparation, a just to go fetch a donkey, it just really encourages me because I realize that our God is mindful. It's not something that he just threw together at the last minute. I mean, we're not told... This is all part of his plan. It's all part of his plan. We're not told when he talked to the owner, if he talked to the owner, maybe he talked to, God talked to him with a vision, a dream. Uh, we're not told. But right. the, the thing is, it was all prepped. And I love that about our God is that... It, he doesn't miss anything. In his economy, nothing is missed. I mean, he's walking where his great-great-grandmother once lived, where she was spared. He's coming into his kingdom. God has this plan. Son of David is being announced and, and all these things. And I just love the fact that God is finishing what he started. And, and for me, it just, if people, if folks haven't put their trust in this God who is started to put this plan of salvation together, my question is, why not? Right. Because he is faithful, and, and we see that he's a, a God of attention, a God attention that's of miracles, di- of miracles and he's, he's given to detail, and he said he's going to come again. How serious should we be taking that? I mean, literally. I yeah, mean, I would agree. Definitely. He's, he's definitely coming. I love the fact that our God is that way. Mm-hmm. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't mince around. He doesn't. Even though he was tunnel vision, he does still, it by the book. He does it by the book. Yeah. And we know how the book ends. <laughs> Praise the Lord. God wins. Amen. Anything else stick out to you in that section? No, let's go ahead and finish it up. All right. Uh, we're in Mark eleven seven through 10. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it. And he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road. And others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David, Hosanna in the highest. Now it's easy unless you have some cross references noted in your Bible or you have a history of understanding Jewish culture to just gloss over this and wonder, well, this is kind of interesting. People throwing the cloaks down on the road and the leaves and all that kind of stuff. What's this all about? Well, it's actually a fulfillment of Zechariah's prophecy. And a little side note about the prophet Zechariah from the Old Testament. He actually was born during the exile in Babylon. Remember when Daniel and our Daniel study was there? It's most likely that Zechariah knew Daniel because he was born in Babylon during that exile. So here is a prophecy given to Zechariah all the way 500 years before Jesus does what he's doing here today. And notice how, like James says, God is tying those pieces together. It's our Zechariah 9.9, and it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. <laughs> Amen. Now, I got to tell you, that kind of stuff just blows my mind. I mean, there are at least 300 of those kinds of prophecies where God foretold hundreds of years before it was ever going to happen exactly how it was going to go down. And yet still some doubt. I mean, to me, it's so obvious that how can you not see it unless you're blind? Unless you're blind. What's also interesting in this is if you'll study the passages, you know, the synoptics that talk about this entry, this triumphant entry into Jerusalem, you'll discover that there was a crowd that went before Jesus. He's kind of in the middle, and then there's a crowd behind. 
but they were all singing. I tell you, I love it when our church, everybody's singing. They're just something beautiful. Wouldn't you agree, guys? I mean, you guys on stage get to see. They know which of you aren't, by the way, just saying, okay? <laughs> I don't want to know, okay? I, I'm, I'm pretending in my mind like we're all, all singing. But they're all singing. And part of what they're singing is Hosanna. Now, this is a very unique word. It's only used in this triumphal entry. It's the only place you find it in the New Testament. The word literally means to save, to heal, Hosanna. It's basically a plea that's wrapped in a praise. Because in their mind, he is the guy. He's the guy who is in fact going to fulfill Zechariah's prophecy and save them. And part of what they're singing is the great Psalm 118. And let me show you the part and part of what they weren't singing because they didn't know. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God. He has made his light to shine upon us. And then notice this very profound prophetic verse that they weren't singing. This is part of the original psalm. Bind the festal sacrifice with cords up to the horns of of the altar wow right there in that psalm was foretelling what Jesus was on his mission plan to do to be the sacrifice bound to the cross and they're crying out Hosanna Hosanna to the highest these people who have been looking for a king are crying to the heights of heaven not unlike how I think Bartimaeus was crying out they're shouting out Hosanna to the highest, that their king has finally come. This one that Daniel talked about and we referenced last week. This one who would come that had not just a temporal kingdom, but an eternal kingdom. Not a king who would die, but a king who lives and reigns forever. And ever, and ever. You know, the thing that fascinates me about the Daniel prophecy is that most of his book is about these kings and kingdoms. Most of those visions, that's what they were about. But he has the one of this Mashiach Nagid, this Messiah King. And that, that's what everybody's looking forward to. Do you realize that our world is still pretty much hung up on kings and kingdoms? We call them different now, right? We call them leaders or presidents and that sort of thing. Even just this last week, somebody was telling me in between services you know, about churches that were bombed intentionally you know, in Egypt, I guess, earlier today or late yesterday. This last week we saw our president bombing this other nation in retaliation against that president. We hear all about all of these kings and kingdoms still on this earth, but it's not about any of those kings and kingdoms. It's about an eternal king and an eternal kingdom. Because part of what we're told about when he comes back is that that kind of stuff is supposed to happen. When we read or we hear about that kind of stuff, what kind of emotion should we have? excitement we should be like Bartimaeus we should be expectant we should be like the crowd that's there that day wow the guy he's coming Amen. he's here he's going to deliver us from this world that we live in how many of you today have that in the forefront of your mind in your heart that you're living expectantly for that do you remember I told you on the front end that I think this could be one of the most important Passovers in our lifetime I also told you that there were 41 jubilee cycles from Adam to Abraham. There's also another 41 cycles from Abraham to Jesus. I told you that, right? What I left out is guess when the next 41 year or 41 cycle, 50 years in a jubilee from Jesus comes. You're in it. You right now are in the 41st jubilee cycle from Jesus. 41 from Adam to Abraham, 41 from Abraham to Jesus, 41 from Jesus to us. Now, if that isn't good enough for you, <laughs> let me share one other little tidbit. And I don't want to make too much of this, but I don't want to make the mistake of going too lightly with this information. Some of you have heard about this, but there's a very provocative thing happening this fall. It's September 23rd. Even the scientists and the astronomers are blown away by this. Their belief is this has never happened in human history. 
At least in 7,000 years of history, we know for sure this has never happened. But basically what's going to happen, if you'll look at this alignment in the sky, is all of these stars and planets come together in this very interesting pattern that's never happened before. And very profoundly looks a lot like what Revelation 12 says, where it says, There appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, that's the constellation Virgo, the moon under her feet, you see that down there at her feet, and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. Those are the 12 planets of our solar system. Wow. It's not uncommon for nine of them to be over Virgo. What's a mind blower is that three other planets join in that cycle. Sign of the times. I don't know exactly what all that means, but I hope you're expectant. I hope you don't want to be the kind of Bartimaeus that after God has done this amazing thing for you, you just go home and watch TV, right? That instead what you want to do is you want to follow him, you want to tell all your friends and neighbors about him and let them know that his kingdom is coming. Amen. And if in fact he shows up on the scene this fall or anywhere in the near future, you're ready for it. You're anticipating for it to happen. This year, could I ask you, this is your pastor speaking, make this Passover special. Some of us, myself included, have already been preparing for this. I plan to take additional preparations even before our Seder on Wednesday. But take this week and make it special. Even if Jesus isn't coming back this fall or any time in the immediate future, it's still worth celebrating. Would you agree? Amen. Because he was willing to come and give his life. Don't let Christmas or any other thing be more important to you than this time of year. Because this is really what it's all about. Amen? Amen. Would you stand? And James is going to close us in prayer. <clears throat> Father, far be it from us <clears throat> to be those that miss the, your second coming. Lord, we want to be those that are expecting. We want to be those good stewards of what you've entrusted to us. We want to be used by you, Lord God, to draw many into the kingdom and bringing many sons to glory. We thank you that you're faithful and true to complete and finish what you've started, that you're working in us, that you don't give up on us, that nothing's wasted in your economy, Lord God. Show us in, in our lives personally, Lord, where we can use the things that have been in our past or the things that are present to further your kingdom, to to further prepare for the return of Jesus, the son of David. We thank you, God, that you're faithful. And we thank you for your love. And we pray that you would uh, go with us as we go about this week, as we prepare our hearts, and as we really seek you, Lord, and your return. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now, many of us here, we're just simply needing to be putting more mindfulness into our preparation for his coming back. But I recognize even as I say that, there's some of you maybe hearing this right now that you don't even really understand the first reason he came, which to, was to give his life as a ransom for us, to die on a cross so that our sins would be forgiven. I invite you not to leave here today without hearing the rest of the story, to come and talk to myself, come talk to James, come talk to one of us and say, tell me what I need to know about Jesus. It sounds like you guys are all waiting for this guy and I don't even completely understand why. We would be happy to share with you why. Because what he did for you is pretty amazing. Amen? Amen? Thanks for listening in. If you have any questions about New Life Living, you can call us at area code 505-898-9788 or email us at info at nlnm.org. Until next time, our prayer and hope is you will experience the fullness of the new life Jesus has to offer you.